the RC differentiated sine wave. Let's once again remind ourselves what voltage means. When charges of opposite polarity are held apart, a force of attraction will exist between them. It took a given amount of energy to separate these charges. Let's say it took one joule of energy per each coulomb of charge that was separated. Now we have what is called voltage because of that. The amount of energy stored per coulomb, in this case, it's one joule per coulomb or one volt. So in any circuit that has a battery across it, for example a one joule per coulomb battery, will allow this battery's energy to be released into the circuit where charges reunite and the components use up one joule of energy per each coulomb that flows through one terminal to the other. So that's kind of voltage in a nutshell. So now, how does a sinusoidal voltage source behave? Well, let's first think about a pendulum. Here we see a mass held at position A, about to be released. We say that here, all the energy is its potential energy. When we release the mass, it will swing back to its equilibrium position B. But it won't stop at B because the mass has converted all of its potential energy into kinetic energy. And here we'll be at maximum speed, so it will overshoot, assuming no resistance, and head towards C. Once it reaches C, it will then possess maximum potential energy again and zero kinetic energy. So at that instant in time, it momentarily is at a stop. At a moment later, it will begin to move back down again towards B. Now in the opposite direction, this then is a sinusoidal system and can be modelled as a sine wave. Now in a very similar way, we can arrange for a voltage source to swap its polarity at regular intervals of time, where in this case, it's charges that move from A to C and then polarity reverses and makes them move back to A. This is exactly analogous to the pendulum. It turns out we can easily build a voltage source that swaps over its potential energy in this way. A sine wave is one such source. We can replicate a sine wave voltage source by swapping over the polarity of a standard battery over regular, regular intervals of time we then have an alternating voltage source, a sine wave, which will drive the, mo the movement of charges in the wires like so. Here we are looking at one very short section of wire over different time intervals in a circuit that has a sine wave voltage applied to it. At A1 we see first unit of charge with a little arrow pointing to the right. At this position the charge has its maximum energy, let's say one joule per coulomb. It will of course be a very tiny fraction of a coulomb with much less than a joule of energy available to release into the components of the circuit. Now because the battery polarity has been swapped around at this same moment, the arrow charge will now pick up speed moving inwards. At the time slice B, the charge no longer has any potential energy. As with the pendulum example, all the energy is now kinetic and so charge will be moving at the maximum rate. Now at snapshot C1, the charge has now lost all of its kinetic energy, completely converted now back to potential energy. The polarity of battery has now been swapped over again and so now our charge will begin to move back the way it came. And at snapshot B2, it's back at zero potential and maximum kinetic energy again. Finally it returns where it began at snapshot A2. This cycle will repeat all the while we arrange the battery to swap its potential in the manner of a sine wave. When we say the vibration occurs over a short length of, length of wire, in most cases we mean very short sections. For example, a sine wave of frequency 1 MHz, this vibration distances will be minute. Individual charges move very slowly, but the collective movement, as in a tube packed with touching marbles, for example, is felt everywhere, almost at light speed. So these vibrations occur throughout the wire, effectively, at the same instant in time everywhere in the circuit. Okay, this diagram 
uh, is really covers all the notes. So I'm just going to leave it here for a second so you can take a snapshot of this if you want to read all the detailed notes. But I'm just going to use these notes and read through this diagram on the next slides. I've just uh, made this diagram bigger and I'm, I'm showing the circuit diagram and the plot here. So let's go on to that. So here we've got an expanded view of what I've just shown and I'm just going to read through the notes from that last slide so that uh, you can follow what's going on here. To the left is the RC circuit fed by a sine wave we will use for this example. So a sine wave is feeding this circuit, we've got a capacitor, we've got a resistor, we're measuring the voltage across the resistor. Remember the voltage here is a proxy for the current because the, the resistance is so small that uh, when you drop a voltage across a resistor obviously that is completely proportional to the current so by using a very small resistor which hardly affects the circuit we we've got a proxy for the current here below i've plotted both v in and vc on the same graph so that we can so we got v in and vc so the, the the total voltage drop v in is this curve here and the voltage only the voltage that is dropped across the capacitor is this blue curve now VC, although the same polarity as V in, for most of the time is always slightly less in magnitude due to the voltage being shared between it and the small resistor R. Also, because of impedance of the circuit, the charge flow is slowed down, causing VC, the voltage across the capacitor, to always be delayed in time with respect to the source voltage V in, the, 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 sine, the, sine, the voltage sine wave signal. Knowing that VC has the same frequency as VN, but with a small time delay, I am able to sketch these two curves quite easily, as I know that uh, the uh, V out, uh, sorry, I know that the VC is slightly delayed, so I can plot the VN and then just plot the VC slightly delayed, so it becomes the blue curve here. So that's exactly what is happening in the circuit here. This slight delay is exactly what's happening. So we have a continual voltage time difference between V in and VC except for the crossover points where both V in and VC are equal the delay is highly exaggerated in this plot in reality the crossover points would be at almost the same maximum and minimum values in this plot A, C and E are the crossover points here I will show how these voltage differences affect the charge flow so because I said the V out is here, as I say here, the, the bottom curve is V out. Please note, since R is very small, V out is acting nicely as a proxy for current. So this is a plot of V out, but you can also consider it to be a plot of the current because they're the same, they're just in proportion. So here I'm going to show how the voltage differences affect the charge flow. So we're going to be thinking about the current here, the charge flow. At time A, to see V in is lower, so V in is lower than V C. So charges will be flowing from V C to V in, out of the capacitor, out of the capacitor, into V in. At B, position B, we see the voltage is changing at its fastest pace, heading to a lower voltage value. This means charges will be moving at their maximum rate here leaving the capacitor heading towards v in so they're leaving the capacitor heading towards v in at c both v in and v c at this instant in time are equal voltages that means no charges will flow between v c and v in they can't because they're equal so charge flow is zero at this point here we can see it's zero although uh, the charges are about to start moving back into the capacitor so this is where the the changeover occurs so now the the, the uh, charges will start to come back into the capacitor. From C to E now, V in is at, a, we can see here, from, from C to E, V in is at a higher voltage level, so V in now is higher than VC. So charges then will flow from V in to VC, because V in is higher, so charges are going to flow from the higher voltage to the lower voltage. They have now changed direction and now flow into the capacitor. So now we're, we're going this way. The charges now have changed direction and are coming into the capacitor. At D, the voltage is changing at its fastest rate, heading to a higher voltage value. 
This means charges are now moving at their maximum rate heading into the capacitor. So now charges are moving at maximum speed into the capacitor. So they're coming into the capacitor now at, maximum, at the maximum rate. At E, we have completed one full cycle. And now, in effect, we're back at A. Both V in and VC here are equal. So charges have now stopped flowing and about to change direction, moving back out of the capacitor towards E in. So now they're going to start coming back out of the capacitor towards V in. Note, this, note that the current here, this current, is a sine wave. Also, as this, the voltage is a sine wave. The voltages here are a sine wave. This is a sine wave. But it's just shifted by pi by 2 radians. We can then say that for an RC circuit using a sine wave input, that the current leads the voltage by pi by 2. This last bit are, is not required to understand all of, all, of the, all of what we've just described, but for those who can follow the maths, this is for you, really. Everyone else can stop viewing, as it's not essential at all. In fact, if you don't know calculus, switch off now, as this <laughs> will only be confusing to you. But if you do understand calculus, then you're going to find this uh, very short derivation quite elegant. So looking at this circuit, with this RC circuit, we can use KCL and write V out over R equals C dVC by dT, since current entering the capacitor C dV by dT is the same as the current flowing through the resistor V out over R. From, from the circuit diagram we see that the voltage across the cap is simply the source voltage V in minus the voltage dropped across the resistor. So it's simply this voltage here across here minus this voltage is obviously VC voltage. So then we can replace VC here and write V out equals RC dV in minus V out over dt. So then this is now this. Now since we always ensure that V out is much, much smaller than V in, we can ignore it for this equation, and so we write 2 as 3. So we're going to ignore this now because it's so small, and we just end up with this equation 3. V out equals RC dV in by dt. So that there is what describes everything we've just been talking about. This is, as I've said here, this describes everything I've just discussed within this very succinct and simple equation. Now, if you apply that to a sine wave, and you'll understand why, that is a, a powerful equation. Everything I've just, this whole tutorial that took a long, long time, <laughs> is basically described from this one, one equation. Uh, uh, that's assuming you understand calculus and what a... Uh, what differentiation is and the fact that that's a gradient yeah so that's uh, this this uh, tutorial in the lab I'm just going to look at a square wave differentiated in the oscilloscope we're going to look at sine wave differentiated going to measure the voltage across the capacitor and across the capacitor plus the resistor the scope should show the upper graph plot of V in versus VC which we just looked at and with the scope showing both V in and VC now I'll use the graticules in the oscilloscope to measure the time delay between V in and V C. So I'm going to be able to measure that very small uh, time delay here using the oscilloscope. I'm going to be able to measure roughly this time delay. It's not going to be exact, but it's, it's going to be a rough measurement. So that's what we're going to do in the lab. So uh, that's this tutorial complete.